high throughput genomic analysis in children with newborn screening. Okay, just to clarify, I did put out hard copy documents for all of you about these two separate RFAs that you should have at your places, just so that we can keep the two different um, concepts that I'm presenting straight. So I'm going to be presenting two different RFA concepts to you today. The first of these is a U19 Cooperative Research Program Project Award. So this is like a program project, but as a cooperative agreement. And these came out of the Newborn Sequencing Future Initiative that we've been working on in collaboration with our colleagues at NICHD. Overall, the goal of this proposal is to explore opportunities to use genomic sequencing information to broaden our understanding of diseases relevant to the newborn period. And to start with, I'm going to talk specifically about the U19 program. As we've mentioned earlier today, and Jeff gave a great setup for this presentation, the cost of genome sequencing has been dramatically dropping over recent time. And because of this, it came to our attention that we might need to reevaluate as it becomes more technologically feasible and cost effective to evaluate more variants at once, whether or not this is something that we want to be doing in different screening paradigms. We held a workshop in December of 2010 with the goal to look at newborn screening in the genomic era and to help set a research agenda. This was initiated because it was realized that newborn screening may be one of the first areas to adopt genomic sequencing because they already do do a number of genetic testing as well as the fact that this could potentially be a way for individuals to realize lifetime personalized medicine due to the near universal inclusion of individuals in the newborn screening paradigm. And <coughs> it would be useful to start doing some research to determine whether or not having this genomic sequencing information is of additional clinical utility. These would be pilot studies, just a first step along this pathway. This would not be setting a definitive set of disorders or things that should be screened for using sequencing for the newborn screening but rather just looking at this as a first set of pilot initiatives to determine what could genomic sequencing add to newborn screening. And within the workshop, it was really highlighted that we were talking about this in the characterization of screening of newborns, not specifically as newborn screening the public health program, and that we really wanted to focus on what does the sequencing add. There were a number of recommendations that came out of this workshop for what these pilot programs should contain. The first of these was to focus on what the genomic sequencing was adding to newborn screening and then look at, moreover, what this could add to moving towards integrating genomic analysis into healthcare and start anticipating what some of the challenges might be to adding this sort of information into a healthcare setting and whether or not this information is ready at this point in time or what additional utility you would have by adding this information. They really felt that it was important for these grants to look at exploring ethical, legal, and social implications for individuals as well as their parents and the clinicians, as well as really starting to address what the clinical validity and utility was, not just can we do this technically, but what are we getting out of this. We also thought that it was important to focus on higher risk individuals within the workshop. This was mainly driven by a need to be able to reduce costs so that this could fit within a pilot type study and that focusing on individuals that are at higher risk or have a positive newborn screening result would allow you to look at smaller sets of individuals and potentially a set of individuals who are more likely to benefit from the results of the sequence information. Furthermore, along those lines, it was felt that incorporating longitudinal data would be very useful for determining how this sequence information could potentially affect treatment down the line. We're well aware of the fact that there's a lot of contention and issues surrounding newborn screening and blood spots and consent most recently within Minnesota. And so for this program, we would require that all individuals are, have received informed consent for participating, whether that be the parents or the actual individuals themselves, depending upon the age of the individual, when they're, whether they're being recontacted or a newborn who would be screened for the program. Currently, just to give you a feel for how the newborn screening process works, in Maryland, there's about 50 conditions that are screened for, and the results are given back within about a 10-day period. 
the parents only receive information if their child tests positive for one of the newborn screen results. And what we're looking to do is see if you look across the whole genome with sequencing or potentially exome targeted sequencing as a first step, what additional information could we add to this paradigm? This also fits within NHGRI's strategic plan with the idea of moving once again towards the right. We would be looking at delivering genomic information to patients and particularly exploring the implications related to genomics and society of giving this information back to the patients. For the newborn sequencing U19 RFA in particular, our goals are to stimulate research in three coordinated areas and all the applicants would be required to address each of these areas within their application. The first of these is acquisition and analysis of a genomic data set along with clinical research and a component on research related to LC implications of possibly implementing this type of broad DNA-based screening. Within the first component, we would require individuals to acquire and analyze a genomic data set, whether that be whole genome, whole exome, or targeted sequencing of a large number of genes greater than 500. And this would include projects such as applying existing or developing new technologies to get genomic sequence data from newborns, as well as potentially comparing the quality of a blood spot sample versus whole blood. Within the clinical research component, we would look at advancing the understanding of disorders that are identified via newborn screening through this genomic analysis. And we would require these individuals to be in those who have a confirmed positive newborn screen in order to participate. Projects in this component could be areas such as correlating the genomic information with phenotypic data to determine more about prognostic factors or identifying and really trying to address what the additional clinical utility is of adding genomic data compared to the current newborn screening results. The last component would focus on LC research and the possible implementation of this type of genomic screening program. This component would include research such as examining how return of results may affect, affect behaviors as well as identifying and addressing the LC challenges of informed consent when dealing with potential newborn participants. For these studies, we expect that they may either do reconsent for the individuals or would have to initially consent individuals for this type of large scale sequencing, but we require that all individuals have that type of consent, that the sequence would be genome wide or on a large scale, and that they would present a plan for return of results from a CLIA approved lab. We would not require individuals to return results, but that they present a plan as to why they feel that results in their particular circumstance are or are not Oh, important to be returned in that particular grant. They would then require that all applicants deposit their sequence in dbGaP if it is not already deposited and would like applicants to follow subjects longitudinally whenever possible. We would suggest a couple of programmatic priorities looking at multiple diseases or traits to help determine that this is applicable across a wide range of different conditions. For, look for our grants with a greater return of results, a large ethnic diversity of populations, larger sample sizes, covering a larger portion of the genome. Children study within five years of their newborn screening so that we can cover more of the LC implications related to working with uh, newborn patients, as well as applicants that have no data use limitations in order to enhance the reusability of this data. And for these U19s, we would anticipate funding four to five awards. NHGRI and NICHD would each commit roughly $2.5 million per year for five years. And we would encourage participation of other NIHICs in order to fund more applications with a greater range of phenotypes as well as larger sample sizes. And overall, we understand that this is a very complicated issue. However, we feel that with these decreases in costs and the technical reality that this is going to be able to happen soon, that it's worth us starting to take a real first look at this and try and plan out what our first steps could be into this vast wilderness of genomic medicine and how are we going to apply this, potentially in a newborn screening context. I'd like to thank all of the individuals here at NHGRI that have helped with the development of this initiative, as well as our colleagues at NICHD. And with that, I'll take any questions. So. Um, 
as you probably as you know that every state has very different laws mm -hmm. about the retention and use of newborn samples and I'm assuming data although I don't know the the laws around the, the use of data as well so are you going to exclude states where residual research use of the data or samples is not legally permitted because it because it <laughs> well, so, I mean, because the deposition, the requirement that it de be deposited into dbGaP and it have you no know, data use limitations, I mean, that seems fairly restrictive in certain states based on different varying state laws. So the idea would be that a new sample would be collected for this as a research project. So you wouldn't necessarily be using the initial blood spot that was collected for doing the newborn screening, especially since these individuals would be individuals who had already tested positive for a, a newborn screening disorder. In states that do allow for their samples to be used for research, if those individuals had been consented for doing this type of large-scale sequencing, that would be acceptable. Or if those individuals could be recontacted by some way so that they could be consented, that would be possible. But for the most part, we're thinking that these would probably be new sample collections specifically for this research purpose. So, um, sorry if I missed this, but uh, are you going to be collecting just DNA, or are other uh, biospecimens going to be collected, for example, for RNA sequencing or proteomics or methylation or whatever? We have thought about potentially including some other, like, DNA-based uh, methylation, epigenetic, potentially transcriptomic data within this initiative. And the goal is that it's looking more as whole genome, genomic type data rather than just look, focusing on a specific gene. We would require them to do the gene sequencing, but if they wanted to do additional tests beyond that, that would be acceptable. But, but, but wait, RNA and things that Carlos is saying are genome-wide. They're not, it's not one gene at a time, it's, I, right? I mean, so I think that, that that's why you were asking it, is that could you do those, those things? Uh, there's one, there's just a couple of technical points. One is, I didn't see whether you had this, but, but um, with newborns and severe phenotypes, the first thing to do is copy as large DNA changes a copy number because you can account for about 15 percent of, of them with with uh, or at least a lot of those have been identified. So you'd want to know that anyway. I think is that included as part of this, or is it just? Are you just you're exploring what to do? I take it in the in the concept clear. We're we're trying to explore what could genomic approaches add to no, newborn okay. screening. So we would require that they do a genes, a genomic sequencing approach, and that would need to be either whole genome, whole exome, or a large collection of genes, more than 500. After that, they could add on if they wanted to look at CNVs, if they wanted to look I'm, at methylation I'm beyond you that. you want to do the CNVs first, because you're mm. going gonna to immediately know for, for some large fraction of them, at least for developmental disorders. The other thing is, is that, that, that it's going to be harder to get big DNA from blood spots than it will be from whatever else you're fresh blood or whatever else you're doing. So that may, you, you want to be sure to deal with those technical. And they wouldn't be required to do this from blood spots, especially if they're collecting a second sample. If they were going to collect a sample, then it wouldn't necessarily have to be blood spot DNA. It depends on how old the individual is at that point in time. But they could use other sample collection methods. So is the proposal limited to only those kids who test positive to then go back and do more, somewhere within five years of birth. Yes, yes but not the within like five years of birth part. That's something that we uh, we consider to be a programmatic priority. But we, the initiative would require, as proposed, that individuals have a positive newborn screen. Done. Okay. So I guess one question. Um, I have one question, and I have a big concern. The, the question is. Of those um, diseases which are currently part of screening, they've test positive for, how many would normally in routine care go on to have more sequencing? Or is I, this totally research across the board? I don't know the exact numbers of how many would go on to do sequencing. I know that typically genetic testing is only done on the secondary level for some of these conditions. It's only a few of the conditions that, are, that do gene testing as their next step. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, it would be specific genes. Okay, and then uh, my concern is, um, and this is the pediatrician in me, is given the level, the lack of genetic literacy in our population, given the anxiety around pregnancy and the birth, 
And having sat through, are you going to breastfeed or not breastfeed, and seeing people torn apart by that decision, the idea of presenting, what I think is one of the things here, is that um, potentially getting a consent at the get-go, if something's positive, is it okay if we also do you know, further screening? I think that needs major LC evaluation before it's proposed. Uh, my concern is it is just such a vulnerable period, not only for the kid, for the family, and we don't know enough of what to do as an adult if I get some of these things back. And I realize you're taking kids who are positive, but you might find some other things. Um, you know, the whole self-fulfilling prophecy of, well, you know, my kid's positive, why bother? I mean, I just think there's so many LC issues there. I have, I'm quite squeamish about this. I think the LC issues are very interesting and really should be driven, and I'd support that. But um, I think that whole interaction with a pregnant mother, pregnant family, um, of even proposing this at this point, I think is premature. So I can't say that I, th I think our idea was to be able to do the consent after the individuals had already tested positive and received that information back to the parents when they've had their first contact with their genetic counseling and received that they have a positive screening result to see if they would be interested in this as a research project that could potentially provide I think, additional okay, information. I think that is different, certainly, than what I heard. Because I thought you said if they get consent up front for everything, it would cover everything, which I think is a very different scenario. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm sorry if I gave that impression. And testing positive means for disease, right? Not they would be con confirmed screen positive. I So, I mean, it seems to me that um, you don't also want to exclude the people that are rather inconclusive, right? That's the case where the genome sequencing might be the most important. I don't know if this dovetails on the unresolved Mendelian cases, but you could imagine, right, that there are going to be different mutations in different populations that you don't know about, and that's why they don't test positive, they test inconclusive. I don't know if that's a kind of gray zone that we don't necessarily want to open, but it seems like I, know, I think part you don't of the want to people who've been cleared, right? But then what about well, and, and are you sequence? You're only sequencing if it's a disease, but you don't know the cause of the disease, right? You're not going to if somebody has sickle cell anemia, you're not going to sequence their whole genome to prove they have sickle cell anemia, or are you? <laughs> I, there isn't a limit on the conditions. The way that well, beyond that, they are. Conditions that were screened in any state in the United States, though that would be assessed within peer review as to whether or not the application has scientific merit. Wait a minute. I okay, I, I am going to say something if you don't okay. mind. Because I, I don't usually comment on these LC type issues, but I, I think this whole idea, while there are parts of it that have extraordinary value, that somehow the LC piece of this whole concept needs to be looked at first. And there are so many things around some of the issues that Pearl raised, and I, I don't recognize them as a pediatrician, I recognize them as a parent. Um, and there are so many issues around the, the family, the child. Are you going on a fishing expedition? Are you recapitulating a disease that's already there? I, I just am not quite comfortable yet that a lot of issues around this, may, maybe they have been considered in a lot of detail, but I haven't, I, I don't get that feeling. agree with that, but I want to also go back to the other. Um, just looking at this list, we know the causes of most of these genes that are being, I mean, most of these diseases that are being screened already. I mean, beta thalassemia. Why would you sequence 500 genes or the whole exome or the genome from that? What are you, what are you hoping to learn? It doesn't make scientific sense, not, not to mention. No, but what is the rationale? I, I, I thought you were talking about Diagnosed with something, or meaning a phenotype, maybe not even the name of a disease, but you're still trying to figure out what it is. That's what the Mendelian centers are, right? No, I think she said explicitly tested positive. Screen well, I know, positive. and I, I, it didn't register until I just started That's asking I, this. I, I testing positive means for a known gene, yeah. known disease for which 
I think every one of these. For which the test? We, well, and they're tests because we know these pretty well and studied so much. But, so but you could imagine looking for modifier loci, for yeah, example, of CF. But, but, okay, but that, no, but hold on. But hold that on. wouldn't be the next, you, this would not be the most efficient way there, of doing that. There is no reason to suspect any modifier gene is going to be Mendelian. They could, they're, they're going to be just as complex as asthma is. So there's, right, yeah, so the guy I learned that from is over there. So, uh, so, um, uh, so, um, so I'm, I don't see the scientific value at all, or certainly not the clinical. I'm missing something. So I, I <laughs> this idea was a subsequent fishing expedition afterwards. What? That's that's what made me uncomfortable. No, but fishing for what though? So part of the idea was to start looking for modifier type loci and trying to determine if there are other genes or other information out there that could help to define a better treatment for specific individuals or specific subsets of these de diseases oh. as to like what treatment would work best. All right, I understand that and, and that's, I've always fantasized about doing that for, for modifier genes and almost every study that people have done this, in, even in inbred mouse strains, you don't, you don't find it because it's not Mendelian. I mean, you, you, you know, you find huge numbers of variants um, and I guess you could do it like a GWAS in an animal study too, but but basically there've been I don't I think this is true that that, that you just don't you know they don't, they don't fall off a log. I mean they're they're going to be much much more complex. Yeah, I, I I share Rick's confusion. I don't I'm not saying you're confused. I'm confused. I am confused. Um, because it it, it seems to me perhaps naively that the potential of DNA analysis or genomic analysis perhaps in newborn screening is for precisely those things that we don't um, know how to find through metabolic types of modalities, you know, like mass tandem mass spec. So I, I too am confused why, where the real value would be in doing genomic analysis of people who have been, who have tested positive for these extraordinarily well vetted and understood small set of entities. So I, I guess I'm confused. It seems to me that the issue that you're going to confront with this RFA is the whole issue of sequencing newborn samples, right? Yes, you're part of it is to address the LC issues related to sequencing newborn samples as well as can using genomic sequencing information produce the same type of results that you would get from doing the current newborn screening paradigm and what could it potentially add to care and treatment of individuals that are pos tested positive? That would seem a secondary goal, right? Because well, I think I think the thing you're going to crash into is we're sequencing samples from newborns, right? And let's figure out all of the LC issues with that. That that seems to be the driving thing here, Is that right? What needs to be addressed when you start doing this type of research? This isn't meant to address, you know, what can we add to the current newborn screening test, but more of what does the genomic sequencing information add? How do we need to address this from an LC perspective and to start taking those first steps? So, so, as, as, mm -hmm. could, could you apply that then to unknown ones then? It would, it would break the whole thing, right? I mean, the, the unknown, it's what Carlos, what everybody has said, the unknown ones are the reason for doing this. Maybe that's just redundant with the Mendelian. It's something Mendelian is purely research, whereas you're now talking about maybe applying this in a way where you're dealing with the how you, how you would deliver the information. It does have the added problem that mo if they're unknown, you're going to find stuff and they might, they might be actionable and then they probably won't be. So that, then, then it, I'm not sure it's useful from a research point of view, but it's probably, it may not be something that would apply yet. But, but the unknowns aren't at newborns. I mean, by the time they now have been worked up, now we're not, I mean, so. Oh, all right, so, so then apply it to, I mean, there are lots of newborns where so you have no idea what it is. Part, part of the problem here, which, which you know, our, our colleagues at Child Health, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of round and round about exactly how to do this, is that both institutes absolutely believe this is an area where we need to be doing some research to figure out what the future is going to bring. We need data. And it seems to me where I see, from an observing point of view, things go round and round is how do you get your foot in the door? When you just started talking, Rick, about using this truly as a diagnostic of the unknowns, I would have think the pediatrician would have gotten very nervous very quick, as mom may have gotten very concerned very quick, because there's so much unknown. So our idea was 
let's work on a population of individuals who have already tested positive, so they're already into a mode of, oh my gosh, I have a genetic issue I'm already facing, and would we add value, could there be a research design that would then get us into a circumstance for individuals who are already motivated to be involved in this, where we would learn more and then we would set up a circumstance to do the kind of LC research we feel is needed. We can't figure, I mean, part of what everybody's talking about is, if we just say we're going to do newborn screening sequencing, everybody gets very uncomfortable very quick. If you say we've got to just go do LC research, you've got to say, wait a second, but we need a real situation to do this, and otherwise it's just all hypothetical. So council try to help, and meanwhile, child health institutes have had their, who are far more knowledgeable and far more experienced in the nuances of the hard issues around newborn screening. I mean, they've guided sort of, they've been trying to, again, try to find the right balance of where to, you know, sort of get comfortable. So that's what we're struggling with, and, I, we've, and I'm, so I'm not surprised there's a little bit of struggling around the table. Amy, no. you want to say the same first? So I, I was just going to say, um, I think there are areas, and we've heard about a lot of them today, where it is appropriate and, and really beneficial to do the science and study the LC alongside it. This perhaps is not one of those areas because I think the LC issues are so um, entrenched and complicated and deeply seated in the public d debate and domain recently, most recently, that um, I think it could, there could be a lot of backlash around that. And perhaps what you need is first some LC, LC study about sort of some of the issues and then to do it. And there may be scientific questions that can be addressed like, I don't know if one of the questions is technically can we do this, that's a separate issue. But I mean, if it's if it's clinically can we do this, um, this might be one of those areas where there's such social controversy about this that it would be worth it to tease out some of those LC social issues prior to jumping in to the science. Let me press press on it. Do you do you strongly believe you, we could design LC studies in the absence of getting our toes wet at all? What are the? It depends what the what you think the LC issues are. I mean, if the uh, one of the major LC issues is that the public has a huge amount of distrust um, around newborn screening, and so doing research around sort of public perceptions, doing public you know engagement, things like that, certainly you can do in the absence of you know in anticipation of the science. Um, I think there's a, you know, a, 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 there's a lot of LC issues. I think there's issues around the laws. The laws are all over the place from state to state. I think there's a lot of normative questions um, that, yeah, I think you could do in, in anticipation of the science that could help inform the science in a better way. But I'm not saying that's the way you have to go, but this might be an area based on sort of the gut reactions of, oh, I don't know if we should go here right now, that perhaps some preliminary work would be helpful. David? I think it's all admirable goal. Um, and to a certain extent, some of the LC issues have already been pioneered. The fact that there are um, newborn screening programs that already exist is an example of people having worked through uh, you know, the issues before for standard uh, blood testing. And I think what carried the day then was what was being screened for was actionable. If you set up a galactosemia test and a PKU test, a child that's positive, could be offered a dietary modification that um, was could follow the bad news to a to a mother or family that uh, their their child was positive. So the whole thing was actually for the benefit of uh, of the patient, and it focused on those things for which there was something that could be done. I think part of the discomfort here is our realization that if you do genome-wide sequencing, you may now couple the good news of, oh, we have an actionable thing we caught on your child with a bunch of bad news that um, we have now done genome-wide sequencing and uh, here's things that you may or may not want to know that, um, that we can't do anything about. I think one way around that could be to focus on how well the DNA testing does actually come up with the same result as the blood testing for those patients who already, you know, or have a good reason to have their blood test and for which you're delivering actionable stuff. And you could focus the additional DNA discovery on other things for which there is actionable items, but which are not currently screened for, right? So, so I mean, just, just a trivial example. No one is screened for lactose tolerance. But a very high fraction of children actually are lactose tolerant, and there's very simple modifications that, yeah, intolerant. 
and, and there's very simple things that can be done, right? So, so that's a case where if you designed the study um, that was focused on positives, you could get information about how well the DNA tests uh, re recapitulate the results of the blood testing. And I think there'd be a small number of things like lactose intolerance and other stuff that parents and families would see in the same way that they see galactosemia and PKU, that there is, it's useful to know that for my child, there are things that I can then do. And I think focus that way, um, it, it may be possible to get the, the foot in the but door. But that would be responsive. I mean, yeah. that, you gave an example of an application that might very well be responsive. But yeah. and so, then Howard? Yeah, so, so it seems to me what you want to do is maximize both the, um, um, the medical outcomes that could be good and minimize the LC problems. I think that dealing with only a population of parents where their child has already had something wrong found on newborn screening. I don't think most of those people see that as good news. I mean, we know it is good news in many ways, but I don't think most of them see it immediately as good news. So it, it, it seems to me that a very, um, that a focus on what conditions could a DNA-based newborn screen actually benefit people and study the LC questions in that context. So I would think about you know, not doing genomic sequencing in a sickle cell patient, I don't know what you're going to find out there, but to say, okay, what are those conditions where DNA might have something to offer? So I think about yeah, um, some of the immune defects, um, um, hearing loss, right? Things for which tandem mass spec is ineffective right now. So, so immediately what you've said is we're going to have the potential to pick up useful things in, because those are actionable in these kids, um, and then study the LC questions in that because you're, you're giving them some possibly positive outcome. Whereas if you're already picking kids who have a, a newborn screen positive, I'm not sure what you're offering those families. So, so what you said it would be the unknowns. Hearing loss, there are a million ways of having right. hearing loss, and so you know And DNA might have something to offer. Sure, but, but if you... I, I mean, I, I, Hear, hearing loss is on the list. Yeah. No, no, I know. So there are, <laughs> I, I, but out of this list, there almost all of them are single gene where it's really, really, really well defined. If you sequence a beta thalassemia, first of all, they do a if, if if there's beta thalassemia in the family or alpha th thalassemia, they'll they'll do some kind. There, there are tests that you can do. Often they sequence the gene and figure out the mutation. It's a small gene, and so you, uh, the only thing you're going to learn. Uh, would be if they're compound heterozygotes or something like that, and maybe something about knowing this is a harsher mutation than that one. But you don't need to sequence uh, more than you know three pieces of DNA for beta globin. Tiny. I mean, why? I right. But what I'm you, saying is, for example, for for hearing loss, which, right? One could imagine a panel of, of several dozen. Absolutely. Yeah. Depends on the phenotypes, but most of them don't don't make sense in my view. Right? Like, like like sudden cardiac death, sure. right? Like that's one of the ones where you would totally want to screen it. It, and we can't, right, but I mean, but those the, the information's unknowns. building up. Those are unknowns, right? Or you know the genes. You might know some genes. You know some unknowns. of those genes, right? But if you screen, then like people would get that information, uh, you know, like the, you know, what athletes that die at 19 and then you find these mutations, right? Then that's one of those things like you totally would want to know that. When it's, early on. When, it, when it's multi, sorry, when it's heterogeneous, meaning it's even heterogeneous Mendelian, then yes, you want to. And, and we don't know all the causes of them, then I think you have a really good chance of doing something about it. When it's, I mean, if this was, if you were talking about Huntington's disease, I know you're not, because it's not newborns, it doesn't do, you're not gonna learn anything from sequencing the rest of the genome. You're, you're certainly not gonna get anything about modifiers with that. And I think that's true for, for most of the things on the list. So I think, I, I just think that that's important to, to it, it just doesn't make sense to do to, to, to do deep sequencing on something where you know the genetic cause and it's not heterogeneous. Howard? I think the suggestions that have been made, especially the most recent ones, are, are, um, are really good and, and are much more positive and uh, feel better than what I'm going to suggest. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> an, 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 another area that, where there's a need for an answer is in the context of autopsy. Uh, and not, I don't mean traumatic autopsy, uh, autopsy for traumatic situation, but for, for newborns who suddenly die. Uh, and not, I'm not even talking about just SIDS, even, even 
even uh, dead at birth, stillborn, et cetera, um, where often families do want to know an answer. It would, it would help them through the grieving process in a, in a way that they often don't have. And that's not a very cheerful place to do the study and, and uh, maybe wouldn't get quite the press, but um, it, if you want a need, um, that is certainly one uh, where, where there, there, there is a need for an answer um, in, in that context. And they're almost all unknowns. Rex? I'm, I'm just curious uh, <clears throat> whether part of the motivation here was sort of a, a pilot of what it might look like for somebody to have a genome sequence in, in their sort of electronic medical <laughs> record, uh, n recognizing you're not going to actually put it in the record, but from, from birth. And, you know, that's something that a lot of people have talked a lot about as we think about genomic medicine is how much of a game changer that would be in terms of not having to ever go out. I mean, is it really the case that you wouldn't have to go out and, you know, test all these other things one by one? Was that part of the motivation for doing this or? Yes, that was something that came up at the workshop. I mean, because at some point we're going to need to do that kind of a pilot test. Now, you know, I'm sort of agnostic about whether we do the LC stuff first and then do that. But, you know, one of the things that comes up over and over again in these genomic medicine workshops and the discussions is the difference between having a, a DNA sequence, you know, in somebody's health record so that a physician doesn't have to go out and order a test because they can just look it up. It's a very different situ scenario from a scenario where you have to go out and order a test and then people don't do it because there are other ways to, you know, warfarin being a great example. If it were there, you would look it up, but if you had to order the test, it's not worth it because you can figure out other ways of, of dosing the, the patient's uh, medication appropriately. So it, I just wanted to get that out at least in the discussion. If the, part of the goal here was to pilot that aspect of genomic medicine, I think that puts a little bit of a different reflection on this. I think it still doesn't take away the ELSI issues, but um, it may provide another scientific uh, reason for doing this rather than to study, you know, uh, Mendelian gene disease, disease genes where we already know what the Mendelian disease gene is. So I'm mindful of the time here. We still have more work to do and it's uh, 5.15. I think we've heard a lot of concerns. Where are you at as a group? Are, do you want to take a vote on this straight up? Do you want to try to I, I, we don't I like guess to I want that, well, the, well the other thing I, I think I want to hear before we do that is um, the council's view on how important is it for NHGRI to be involved in these kinds of studies because you know if the if the feeling and I, I I've heard in the past that this is at, that we're really needed here um, we have a natural um, and a partner in the Child Health Institute who have domain expertise far greater than ours about many of these nuances we have um, a proposal that's cleared their council, and they're enthusiastic. And, and so I'm a little, I'm not saying therefore you have to clear, I'm just saying that we, we are, we're trying very hard to navigate a circumstance where I'm hearing slightly different views even around the table of, oh, well, I see the safe aspect of doing it for individuals already screened positive. No, no, it has to be a real situation. We're going to learn something new. And then I even heard of a proposal that's even very different of autopsy uh, material and so forth. So, and, and, and everybody's nervous about this, which is what has been the case at the workshop and has been the case right. And so I'm, I'm, I, can't, I, I can't quite figure out whether we should sort of recoil completely, but at the same time, we can't figure out sort of how to get our toe in the water, and we need to do this in coordination with another institute. So it's a long-winded way of saying this is really complicated. Um, and I, we knew it was going to be really complicated. It's been from the very beginning. But I guess I'd like to start with the premise. I saw heads, but let me hear more completely. Is this something that NHGRI should be involved in in a serious way in partnership with the Child Health Institute? And what is this? Well, this area. This area of research would, would include clinical research, LC research, and technical research. We'll get to technical stuff in a bit, but, but these are sort of three major areas. And I believe that the technical stuff is going to be the least controversial, and I know the, the clinical stuff is the most controversial, and everybody believes we should be doing LC research in this area. And the problem is cart before the horse, horse before the cart, together in parallel, that's what we're struggling with. And this is, none of this is a surprise because we've been struggling for months about this. I didn't, well, 
Amy was going to raise her hand, but can I just get a quick show of hands? What the is there enthusiasm for NHGRI having a research initiative in newborn sequencing screen? Okay, so that's that's important to know. Now it's just an issue of how do we cast it correctly and in a coordinated fashion with another institute. So Amy, or no, I was just going to say I, I think this is hugely important. Um, I think it needs to be done. I hear concerns about the way this is set up, and I'm particularly concerned in this area because there are such vocal um, activists who have really raised a lot of issues about newborn screening that this needs this this in particular needs to be designed very 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 carefully. Well, I mean, I'm, t I'm talking about the, the class action lawsuits in the different states that have been really championed by a small group of people who are extremely persuasive and active and, and vocal about their opposition to how the newborn screening programs have been set up and utilized and, and research has been done using those samples. So I think we have to be particularly sensitive to those issues or it's going to be a firestorm. But don't you think the, some of the particulars of this situation minimizes the risk? This is not a global newborn screening. This is a group of people who have already been screened positively for something. So to me, isn't it a little different? But, but are the issues? Um, I don't same? think it has anything to do with the issues, frankly. I, I think it's I think it's public perception. I don't think the initial round of attacks had anything really uh, a whole lot to do. I mean, it had some to do with the issues, but. I think it's a it's a public perception, public relations issue around the LC issues associated with this. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I just I just think that the way that this concept is being put forward it doesn't give enough, in my mind, attention to the sensitivity around this. It, it seems to me that it would be it'd be very helpful to have more um, justification on the population that's being selected for this. And, you know, and it seems to me, at least, that uh, having uh, some very significant benefit to the patient population would mitigate a lot of these issues. I'm also curious as to, for this type of study, uh, would it not also be useful, or at least in, in, in some types of studies of this type, to consider sequencing the parents as well? And has that been considered? Yeah, we have considered potentially doing trios as well as being responsive. So I agree it's a critically important area. And I actually think the fact that it's a, in partner with child health is really good as well because um, if there's any institute that should be particularly sensitive to uh, exactly the kinds of things that are coming up around the table, it, it, it's also them. So I think that's a great partnership and it's a great opportunity. I personally, having expressed my own concerns, I would also be happy if the call for proposals is written in such a way that you make clear that you want um, proposals that will also address LC concerns in the area. And what you may get from the RFA is exactly the same range of diversity of things that have come up around the table. There may be proposals to focus on you know, genetics of early childhood death or uh, genetics of other positively actionable uh, items. And um, that, you, you can decide at the time that the proposals come in whether you think uh, the various groups are addressing what you want to see addressed and doing it in a way that will avoid opposition and look like a positive uh, contribution to the field. So that's, that's my bottom line on uh, what I think is an opportunity. I like the partnership with Child Health and my concerns could, could be addressed by seeing what actually comes into the poll. So I'm hearing two different things. Let me float two balloons and see what you think and attempt to try to get some consensus. Well, I mean, one possibility is, is, we'll call it the Kingsley model, is that we go with this RFA. Could we rename that? No, we will not. The David model. No, I don't. So, no, we will. That I heard that they're that they're that um, to to craft the R, to approve the RFA, but craft it in a fashion that let the review process see the diversity of options, not overly constrain it, and see what comes in, and let the review process dictate what ultimately gets funded. There is another model I was just floating with my colleagues. Is um, the the other model recognizing that this is a really complicated area and that there is tremendous. Expert history and expertise of the Child Health Institute. 
that I don't pretend to a minute for a minute to fully have compared to them, is that maybe we should, because of some of the concerns raised and actually some of the contradictory concerns about how to get our toe in the water, would be to defer this for now and ask, uh, we would, we would um, recruit a subset of council to help us work with some of their experts and maybe some advisors that they would bring in and to try to do through conference calls some coming to the minds and recrafting of the RFA and bring it back in May where we could bring it, with both institutes would be happy and both sets of advisors in this area would be happy. So those are two options. Maybe there's a third option. I don't know, Terry or Anastasia, if you, know, you like those are sort of two. Tell us whether we like them. Well, two. So <laughs> what are people's reaction to those two different I'll models? Just put your downside of having an SRO at the council table is that review committees don't comment on programmatic issues. So write a very clear RFA and ask them to review the scientific and technical merit. They're not going to sort this stuff out. You'll just get a wreck at the review. <laughs> but the study design, I mean, what I think the study design is still the big issue here for, for me. And I think you really want to, I mean, maybe you would get a lot of people writing in to say, yeah, we'll do this with sequencing 500 genes. But, but um, I think that's a mistake to, to put something like that in. It needs to be that, that I, I, I'm very much in favor of doing something. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I agree with all of the issues. It's really important. But I think that, that piece needs to be better defined because you're, what if you get ones where they're doing a great job on the LC and the other issues and it just makes absolutely, I mean, you're, you're not, and you gain zero scientifically from it because it's, it's not a well thought out design. It's like, it's like I had so many people come to me over the years wanting to do a GWAS on four samples that they had. I mean, you know, it, it, you need to really have it but where... they're really well phenotyped. Well, maybe, yeah, but, no, no, but I mean, but, but, I'm, but I'm serious about that. I think that's, that's, that's the important, I don't know what it should be. I'm, I'm a little, I'm struggling with that because, you know, some of them, yes, but most of them won't. I, I would vote for the, the second option because I think the problem with David's proposal is that it's just this one sentence in here written out says uh, with a confirmed positive newborn screen and on the basis of all this discussion well we could take that out I mean I think David's model was take that out and have it be more people could come in and whatever study time they want in the peer review process I, sort of I think it's worth weighing in to say I prefer the Eric model so okay. um, so the second one <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Um, so do, do, is there, uh, can I quickly see people now, do, should we, are we leaning towards the second model? Yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be David versus me, this is fine. I, okay. So we should defer this and partner some of you. Yes. We will be calling on you to work with Child Health and some of their advisors and, and I'm sorry? I have a hard time seeing how we're gonna have any other discussion five months from now, four months from now. I mean, I think David's Eric model um, yeah, it was uh, let the marketplace decide what's the right study, including the LC point. Yeah, yeah, right. Because if we if we if we go in circle around and and then come back next council meeting, what else are we going to say? <laughs> we're going to say I, the same thing. Yeah, I think the main objections were confining it to that one population, right? That was where I got confused. I think if you took that out and then. And, and emphasize the importance of the LC investigations as part of this, I think, like you say, then you see you'll probably get some very good proposals. So, David, and if there are LC concerns, they'll get, they'd get raised at review, right? Yeah. If somebody proposes something that... Very clear, like with, with Caesar, that, that the LC stuff, because the, the kind of things like yeah. that Amy mentioned, have to be by the major driver, but you also want to ask some interesting science. And it'll come back here. I mean, whatever comes through study section will come back here again. So we wouldn't get out without Amy giving it a thumbs up. So what we don't know at this moment in time is whether the Child Health Institute will be comfortable with an RFA that has removed that sentence. Now, now you can approve it. With, we can remove, we can go with, back to David's mm -hmm. model. We can modify it, pull out that sentence, approve it, We'll go back to child health. If they're not comfortable, then we go to my model, where we'll have to sort of get the groups together and come up with something that both institutes can be comfortable with. And, and I think I'm sensitive to the fact that it is an institute collaboration, which means there may already be resentment if they've approved it that NHGRI comes back and says, um, you know, NHGRI council rewrote uh, right. um, the, the, the RFA. I think just politically, 
um, and because there's so much expertise there, it would be good if we have to refine the wording of the RFA to do it with them rather than uh, to try to rewrite it ourselves right now. Michael? So, so if we go with the disowned model, <laughs> I'd like to get rid of the 500 genes. I think 500 genes rather than whole exome and whole genome doesn't make sense personally, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to go with okay. the ERIC model, in which case it becomes irrelevant. I would strongly support that uh, based on comments I made earlier. If this is really meant, at least in part, to be a model for having pre-existing genomes, 500 genes doesn't make any sense. Okay. Pearl? I guess if we go with the disowned model, I would further emphasize my concerns. To me, that is the, the bigger concern. And I think that's LC issues would have to come first on that one before dipping a toe in the water. Because I think even that first subject you got, I mean, we don't know what's actionable. And we just, you know, we're just funding other people to figure that out. So now we're going to do it on newborns. I mean, I, you know, and lactose intolerance isn't kind of, isn't there. I mean, people, you know, they want to know what their kid is. And I think so it sounds like you would even be opposed to. I'm even more opposed to that. To that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Sorry. I think I think no. I mean, but, but <laughs> no, but I, I I really want to emphasize Pearl's Pearl's view of this is 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 a, you know we have heard this. I mean you know this is a lightning rod issue. We know that there's a lot. so there are there's many opinions out there and there's a lot of sensitivities and we truly are trying to find some middle ground here. So I'm not surprised that there's not unanimity around this table. There's not been unanimity associated with any of our discussions. So, or at the workshop. So this is very hard, and, but we're not being chickens, we're hitting it head on, but it's hard. Okay. So you know where we are, Rudy? No. Okay, <laughs> excellent. I think we're ready to vote. I'm not sure what we're ready to well, vote. Well, I think we, I, well, here's what I think we should do. Maybe it would help if we had an up and down vote on David's amendment, which removes that sentence, and also Michael's amendment, which, remo so it removes the sentence, so it's, it's free game to sequence, or, and it removes the 500 genes. But is it clear what you're putting in? Of well, it, well, 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 no. Gonna every kid. Well, it's phenotypes though. So. The application should not. So you're not talking about a screening drug, you're talking about sick kids that come back yeah. in. Yeah. There's something wrong with my kid. Yeah. This is no longer a newborn screening drug. That, that's why we would have to bring this back to NICHD. Right, but we, we at least, we can at least, if we remove that sentence, it means that the grant, the applicant would tell us the experimental design and what population of individuals. And you emphasize else. Could, I, oh, else is going to be heavily emphasized. Yeah. Right. And so, and we take out the 500 genes, and then we have something to go back to child health with. That's the, that's the one virtue of having a, a vote now. Um, and and if it's if we need to or something, then we get back together and talk about. When it. you go back, would we feel uncomfortable? Sorry, no, you go ahead. Would we feel uncomfortable with it saying diagnosed or undiagnosed? And then you could have some folks that might propose a screening program, and then you might have some that would propose a screening plus some degree of looking at unresolved cases. Because you don't, if you if you say undiagnosed, then you're totally opening it up, right? You know, in, in the other direction. So, so then you leave, it, you leave it up to, again, you leave it up to interpretation of what is a newborn screening program and you let the best idea I mean, flow to the top. Maybe a grantee, if they were doing only the ones that are diagnosed, maybe a grantee will have some rationale for why you'd want to sequence genome-wide that I can't imagine, but I, but, or others Or they might, imagine. I mean, what I could but, imagine is somebody doing a mixture of diagnosed and undiagnosed where they would choose I, some set of things that they know are going to work and then, then use that as a way to build up a more complex set right. of questions that they might so want that, to answer. That may be, may be a way to do it. But one thing I think is important is that when you do go back to child health, health you need to discuss that issue because right. the, real, the issue is why are you doing this? What, is the, what are you, what are you way, doing? They're just, all watching this on the web, so they're hearing this okay. discussion, which is great. No, it's very helpful because we're going to have this discussion. Uh -oh. Actually, they're in the hall, right? right. <laughs> no. no, I mean, they're, they're, they're just really good. That, so they're hearing all this, and, they're gonna, and this is going to form the basis of our discussions with them. So I didn't know if we really wanted the undiagnosed or diagnosed, or we wanted just to take that sentence out. Is there, I, I don't have it in front of me, so I can talk. But, it seems to me we could it's just easy to take the sentence out. Take, huh? take the sentence out, take out 500 genes. And I think that's the proposal on the table. And I think we should do an up or down vote. And I think if the vote passes, then we go back to child health. And if that's, we can work out a framework with them, we go with that. If it does not pass, then we go back immediately to, to discussions with them to figure out how we can get our advisory groups and their staff all comfortable with signing. 
and with the understanding that there is strong support for something yes. like this. Right. So is it clear what we're voting on? We're going to vote on this amended version of the concept clearance. OK, take it out. Go ahead, read it. Okay. It's uh, more specifically, each applicant will be expected to collect a comprehensive genomic data set from infants with a confirmed positive newborn screen, brackets, for any condition currently screened for by a state newborn screening program, close brackets, and analyzes those data in the context of a scientific question relevant to the diagnosis or treatment of a medical condition relevant to the newborn period. <laughs> yeah, are, are we just taking out the part that refers to them having to have a confirmed positive yeah. newborn screen and leaving the rest of the yeah. sentence? Is that the con Yes. I think we should just take out that it has to be confirmed because I think we want all the second half of the sentence is definitely what we want. It has to be relevant to the newborn period, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is our second option to vote on, on option two? <laughs> Which is to just <laughs> not even try to pass, so many, yeah. not even to pass the concept clearance. Not, and not to just convene the smaller groups and have the discussions and Yes, that is absolutely an option. And come back in May. I mean, the fact that there's this very specific um, requirement in this sentence suggests that there's some, you know, there's some thinking behind that. And maybe it makes more sense <laughs> to go back and revisit that with people who really understand the, the thinking behind it. If you take out all the diagnosable here and you're looking for the symptomatic kid in a newborn period who's going to populate this database, you got to think about what you're looking at. I mean, how many are just going to be disease of prematurity, you know, highland membrane disease? Are you going to include that? Are you going to really look for things where you don't have an answer? And I'm just worried. We don't even know what that population Sorry. We don't even know what that population is. Um, so I think that would need a lot more work in terms of ferreting out, you know, if kids who aren't picked up by, this is just a list, um, are you going to take anyone with a symptom, um, newborn period, are you talking one month, six weeks? Oops, it probably is mine. Yeah, how's that? Okay. Sorry. Anyway, so I think, you know, that needs some more feathering out, too. These are the reasons I think it's hard to rewrite at the NOVO, and there's, because issues are important. And there is a companion institute who, um, you know, has a lot of expertise and cares a lot about. So people. I'm hearing support for my model. Yeah. So let's not let's let's table the concept clearance for now, and come back with after a, a joint venture discussions as I described. Okay. Want to get a vote on that? All right. So, uh, be honest, I don't know if you can defer. Um, we may have to just table it. Can't we just table? I think you have to have a vote on it. Oh. You're clearly denying. I'm asking for a vote on the concept clearance that's before us, and then there was another message that's going to go back to child health. Okay. So all in favor of the concept as proposed in this document? All opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. 